Hello everyone to this colloquium session on identity recognition in ancient Greek. My name is Chiara Palladino. I am assistant professor of classics at Furman University and I am presenting on a little project that I did together with Fari Makarimi at the University of Cologne and Brigitte Matiak also at the University of Cologne. Um, so during this presentation, I want to give you a short introduction on the topic of named entity recognition, specifically for what concerns ancient Greek, the language. And I want to illustrate some of the current methods that are um, used to perform named entity recognition in this field, which, as you will see, is a bit more peculiar than uh, modern languages in general. And then Farima will introduce the methodology that we have adopted to perform the nitty recognition in a different way um, on a minimally annotated corpus with a CRF model. And then finally, we will discuss uh, briefly the results and the limitations of that. So very shortly, named entity recognition, as you will all know, is a fundamental task in natural language processing, or NLP, and it consists, broadly speaking, in the recognition, extraction, and possibly classification of uh, the so-called named entities. Um, and at the most basic level, by named entities, we mean uh, names that are commonly capitalized, such as personal names, place names, group names, and so on. Uh, but this category can be easily expanded, as we shall see, um, to include many other text strings. Um, for modern languages, uh, and particularly Central European languages in English, uh, there are many text analysis frameworks, methods, pipelines that perform this task as an integrated task with many others, like tokenization, lemmatization, normalization if necessary, pedo speech tagging, uh, morphological tagging, and so on. And the two most commonly used ones are the Stanford Core NLP and the Natural Language Toolkit, NLTK. However, um, none of these services support ancient languages out of the box directly. And this depends on the fact that um, ancient languages, and particularly ancient Greek in our case, um, is a non-standard standard language in terms of NLP research. First of all, it is an inflected language, uh, as much as German, for example. Um, but most importantly, it is currently scarcely annotated and, in and indexed, uh, which is a common problem to many historical languages. Um, what this means is that most uh, natural language processing tasks uh, that have a solid infrastructure for modern languages will not work in ancient Greek if based upon the same principles. So ancient Greek right now does not have particularly accurate or reliable lemmatization services, which is particularly important, as you can imagine, for an inflected language. Um, most authority lists are particularly scarce in terms of entries in the original language, so most uh, references that we have, especially when it comes to named entities, do not have an actual entry in ancient Greek. They only have an entry in English or in Latin, uh, at the very least. And there are also, for what concerns ancient Greek in particular, there are components that are rarely encountered in modern languages which complicate things a little bit, uh, such as macronization, which is just uh, the insertion of a macron, a particular diacritic on letters, prosody tagging, dialectal forms, which have a significant impact on morphology and inflection, and so on. We will discuss um, what this means in a bit. And finally, because in ancient Greek in particular, electronic texts have been circulating for a while, uh, normalization processes right now tend to be more complex and time-consuming than in most modern languages due to the lack of consistency that has been around, especially in legacy texts, uh, in the usage of Unicode characters. And this largely has to do with the fact that ancient Greek has a complex system of punctuation and diacritics as well. Um, even when these services exist, like normalization and tagging, um, they exist, they tend to exist as standalone tools. So they're not part of an actual, of an, of an actual pipeline. Uh, and there is no strong infrastructure um, and definitely no well-defined workflow that may work as well as, for instance, you know, NLTK for German or English. Um, there are also a couple of hindrances, a couple of problems that regard specifically the field of named entity recognition um, for ancient Greek that largely depend on the status of digital scholarship for ancient Greek texts. Um, 
And particularly, they concern the status of current reference lists. I briefly mentioned this in the previous slides, but I would like to um, expand on this a little bit for a second. Um, the reference lists that we have right now, as I mentioned, do not contain, tend to not contain the original end entries in ancient Greek. Uh, so the ones that we have, um, aside from being particularly inconsistent, um, tend to be um, tend to have very little coverage of the original names for what concerns prosopography and topography, and particularly for literary sources. Um, and this largely depends on the fact that even in traditional scholarship, there has been limited effort in creating updated indexes and references for ancient names, for people and places in particular. Um, and so while in ancient Greek, uh, literature and critical uh, uh, literary and crit critical sources, there are consistent scholarly efforts with, you know, publishing new texts, coming up with new critical editions, and so on. Most of these efforts do not actually translate in the creation of digital, especially, indexes and reference lists. Um, so new toponyms, new personal names, new group names are actually not translated into dictionaries or reference lists. And this is, as you can imagine, a big problem. Um, a related problem is, as I mentioned, the fact that we do not have a lot of fine-grained annotated named entity data. So most of the corpora that we have for ancient Greek texts are not annotated. Um, there, are limited, uh, there, there are limited annotations for part of speech. There is almost no annotations for named entities in original ancient Greek sources. Um, another side of this issue is, again, part of speech tagging. While we do have some part of speech taggers for ancient Greek, they definitely do not work as well um, as with modern languages, especially when it comes to named entities to names. And again, this is a vicious circle, right? Because we have lack of scholarship, because we have lack of names that can function as training data, our post taggers are not trained to recognize names, and so they do not work as well. Um, so, again, this is this all depends on a lack of a suitable infrastructure that could improve our named entity recognition tasks. To sum it up, um, names are special words, and even in cases where lemmatization and part speech tagging work as well as it gets, uh, named entity recognition and classification is still a strong challenge in a, in a number of um, literary domains, and especially when it comes to literary sources, where notions of named entities can be inconsistent and blended, so to speak, it is particularly challenging to extract, to come to a decent level of accuracy in the extraction of names. Um, I will spend a minute illustrating some use cases uh, for named entities in ancient Greek, just to give you uh, the ground uh, of the problem and give you a better sense of what we are talking about uh, concretely. So uh, I will restrict my observations to um, the basic types of names, so place names, ethnonyms or group names, and personal names, uh, because these are by far the most basic uh, cases. But as we mentioned, um, the notion of named entities can be easily expanded to a variety of other capitalized strengths and um, words. For example, like just to make a couple of examples, historical names, uh, historical events, like the Peloponnesian War, right? or time periods and dates, like Middle Ages, or Spring, or March 3rd, um, or bibliographical references, like The Histories by Herodotus. So there is a variety of named entities that, uh, for reasons of brevity, uh, we are not considering in this topic. So, most commonly, uh, we find place names in sources, right? Especially, for example, in works of history, which largely deal with, you know, people doing things in places. Um, and obviously, place names can also be classified as various levels of granularity when it comes to classification. Um, it depends on how fine-grained your classification want, uh, wants to be. So Alexandria is a city, like a point on a map. But Egypt is a country, uh, a polygon on a map. Um, and then there are two word names, like Red Sea, right? or three word names, like Isthmus of Corinth, where one of the words is actually not capitalized, 
four names, four word names, Roman Agora of Athens. Names that would not be named entities were it not for the context, like the Tower of the Winds, uh, which is an actual uh, location, and composite names that use other place names as landmarks, like Ethiopia Beyond Moors. Moors is actually a group name. Um, and largely the same issues uh, are valid for group names uh, or ethnonyms. So we can have simple names like Athenians, the Persians, and so on, but also variant specifications of a name that actually indicate different entities. For example, the Scythians is a different population group than the Scythians beyond Thrace. And the Ethiopians is actually a different population group than the Western Ethiopians beyond Mauritania, which has a population that definitely doesn't correspond to modern Ethiopia uh, and is located south of the Sahara Desert. Um, again, personal names largely have the same problem, so we can have a simple one-word name like Pericles, but we can also have uh, a combination of name and family names, like Pericles of Xanthippos, Pericles the Alcmaeonid, Pericles of Athens. Um, and Greek is very big with patronymics, uh, maybe you know this, so sometimes uh, a person can be indicated with the corresponding patronymic, which in English would be, for example, the son of Xanthippos rather than Pericles. And evidently, in this case, one of the words is not even capitalized. Um, so with these distinctions in mind, uh, it is easy to understand that there are multiple issues when it comes to fine-grained um, classification, not just extraction. Um, and so it may be all right to extract named entities just, you know, simple uh, out of a text. But classification is whole another animal, um, and it is especially problematic because, again, we lack suitable authority lists and references, as we mentioned before. And the problem extends to a variety of uh, issues. For example, um, it is not enough to identify Alexandria as a place when there are 26 other Alexandrias on the atlas. Um, and at the same time, the string Athenian can indicate a person or an ethnic reference. Um, there are two other problems that I would like to discuss briefly because they're relevant to what we are going to discuss uh, later with Farima. One is the added issue with lemmatization and part of speech tagging that we encounter uh, when we deal into dialectal variation. Uh, as some of you may know, ancient Greek is in fact not one language. It is a multitude of dialects. Among the most famous we find um, Attic, Doric and, Ion and Ionic. And the use of one of these dialects in a text impacts significantly on um, the performers, the performance on NLP, NLP tasks, uh, because one of the most relevant changes that dialectal variation implies is in inflection and morphology. So, for example, the Ionic uh, declension type uses a completely different vowel in the endings than the Attic one than the standard reference one, and sometimes even different endings at all. Um, and finally, to further complicate the issues, um, especially in later and Biblical Greek, uh, there is a tendency to increase the usage of foreign names, like Nazareth, for example. Um, and foreign names tend to be just transliterated in Greek with uh, completely non-standard endings and morphological patterns, which do not align at all with ancient Greek morphology. So this is an added problem to the training of suitable part of speech taggers. And finally, uh, I will spend the last 10 minutes talking about uh, some of the methods that are most frequently employed in named entity recognition for ancient Greek, just to give you a sense of what has been tried so far. Um, and this will give you an idea of um, what, what is the field in which the experiment that Farima did um, has been attempted. So in the absence of a consolidated pipeline, uh, present approaches to named entity recognition in ancient Greek tend to follow patterns that rely on authority lists and knowledge bases, um, often coupled with, again, a preliminary data preparation phase that involves basically lemmatization and normalization at the most basic level. Um, optionally, part of speech tagging, and so on. And this is a very straightforward method, as you can imagine. Uh, you just parse the text against available authority lists and knowledge bases, such as indexes, uh, online gazetteers, atlases, and so on. 
and the results are essentially a list of named entities that should align as much as possible with the chosen reference list or lists. Um, and of course, the problem with this method is that it entails a massive stage of data gathering and normalization. And for the reasons that I have mentioned before, this is often a more time-consuming stage than named entity recognition itself, because the infrastructure behind reference lists in ancient Greek is not solid at all. Um, a tool that uh, performs relatively accurately this kind of task and that some somehow tries to include the whole normalization lemmatization pipeline in uh, a suitable workflow is the CLTK, the Classical Langu Language Toolkit, which is an open source Python framework uh, that pretty much aims at performing the same type of NLP tasks for historical languages that we have available uh, through services like the NLTK for modern languages. Um, and currently for ancient Greek, um, Classical Language Toolkit is available for a variety of languages, but currently for ancient Greek it supports sentence and word tokenization, lemmatization, part of speech tagging, morphological tagging, basic named entity recognition, as I mentioned, prosody tagging and macronization. And there is a hint to syntax analysis as well. And just so you know, uh, by authority lists, we mean um, things like the Greek lexicon and personal names, uh, or gazetteers like Pleiades, the most famous indexes that are currently available um, in development, like the Trismegistos indexes, and so on. And there is a handful of annotated corpora out there, uh, which however mostly entails English translations rather than, than the Greek text. So the Perseus Digital Library, where most of them are available, and top of text, which is um, specifically for toponyms, specifically for geographical names. Um, an alternative approach to named entity recognition in ancient Greek is to use alignment algorithms to parse a text in ancient Greek against an index or an annotated translation. Uh, this should be available in another language, like English, Latin. Um, the problem with this method is that it actually requires a pretty accurate index in the first place for the chosen text, uh, or else you may need a massive effort of manual disambiguation and annotation, depending on how generous the alignment threshold is. Um, and this is the case of a project like the Digital Athenaeus, uh, which focuses around creating a digital edition of a work by uh, a guy called Athenaeus of Nocrates, who lived in the 2nd century CE. And uh, the Digital Athenaeus created uh, a so-called index digger based on the alignment of the original Greek text against a scholarly index uh, written specifically for this work in Latin, um, and another index, more recent, that was written in English. And they used Levenstein distance to align the Greek um, uh, capitalized words against the corresponding Latin and English index. Um, and Latin particularly is relatively easy uh, to perform this kind of task, and I will show you why. So here, this is an example of the index digger. On one side, you can see the original Greek text with uh, all the colored capitalized entities, and on the other side you can see the four indexes. Three of them are in Latin, one of them is in English. Um, and if you have a look, for example, at the references in, the, in one of the Latin indexes, you can see that the Latin names are pretty much just transliterations of the Greek names. So alignment in this case it is, rel is relatively straightforward, uh, or at least it probably reduces the fuzziness um, that, could, that you could have otherwise if you used an index in another language or no index at all. Um, and finally, the last method is evidently heavy manual or semi-automatic annotation that can generate a text index relatively easily. Um, obviously, this method is the most accurate of all. You get 100% accuracy if you do this with um, a domain expert. But it is also the most, by far, the most time-consuming one. Um, and it is possible to do this in a semi-automatic way, note the semi, uh, with services right, like Recogito, for example, which is an annotation environment created within the Pelagios project, which enables you to manually annotate strings that you manually recognize as named entities. Um, and it validates your annotations against online gazetteers with the linked data enhanced advanced search. So the annotations then can be exported and they can create your actual data set, your training data set. And finally, 
I want to introduce uh, our approach, the approach with conditional random fields that we tested with Farima and that she is going to talk about more in depth. Um, so we decided to test uh, a conditional random field model for to see if we could come up with a suitable accuracy, suitably accurate method um, for named entity recognition with minimally annotated corpora. I'm going to briefly introduce the text because then I'm going to leave uh, word to Farima. We decided to perform this experiment on a very famous text, the histories of Herodotus. And there are several reasons why we decided to use the histories. Um, for those of you who don't know, the histories is uh, an ancient Greek work of history, as you can imagine, um, written by a guy called Herodotus of Halicarnassus uh, in the 5th century BCE. It, it, is, it consists of nine books, and it focuses on the conflict between the Athenians and the Persians, or the so-called Persian Wars. Um, but, so it is a historiographical work in the first place, right? Uh, it concerns people doing things in places. Uh, but actually, the most interesting part concerns toponymic data, because the whole first part of the histories concerns an account of Herodotus's journeys through the Mediterranean. And so every single book, um, or every single part of the narrative, more precisely, is dedicated to a very accurate description of Egypt, Lydia, Caria, Persia, Greece, all the places that were um, political entities at the time in the Mediterranean. Um, so for this reason, we decided to focus our efforts on toponymic data and ethnic groups, um, and also for the related reason that prosopographical data did not have um, as much training data sets for the particular case of the histories. So we decided to focus on uh, geographical named entities, ethnic groups and um, toponyms. The other reason why we decided to do this um, was because we had suitable data sets that could provide um, some sort of external control on our data. Um, of course, we had open data translations in English and of course the ancient Greek text, uh, both of which were provided by the Perseus Digital Library in XML format. Uh, we did have um, part of speech tags for the whole histories, part of which was provided by the Proyal Tree Bank project, part of which was provided by Giuseppe Celano. And we also had a place name, specifically place name data database, which was based on the English translation provided by the Hestia project. And this provided to be particularly useful because it gave us an idea of the number of places that we should have recognized. Now I'm going to the word to Farima, who is going to explain the method that we have adopted, is going to comment on the accuracy, and I'm going to come back for uh, the discussion of the limitations and the results. Hi everyone, my name is Farima. I worked on the technical part of the project with uh, Chiara and Brigitte, and in this part of the presentation, I will be discussing our methodological approach and uh, the results and some of the current steps we are working on right now. So the first phase of the uh, project involved a bit of experimenting. As Kira mentioned, there are some um, data resources available for ancient Greek. For example, um, there is a list of place names on Topos text and we decided to start with this simplest approach and use this list of place names to find all of the place names occurring in Herodotus' histories. Um, the weakness of this approach is that um, it is highly reliant on the limitization services that are available and these limitizers are usually at the time not very, uh, do not perform very well. So after we um, tried this approach we noticed that it's not very successful, even though it, it helped me to get to know the type of data I'm working with a bit more and um, prove to be useful in the whole scale of things. So we decided to then go with a machine learning approach and uh, chose conditional random fields uh, as a model because it is pretty robust and also easy to configure. Uh, it is also easier to interpret the predictions and the results of the model uh, when you compare it to more state-of-the-art um, methods, um, for example, deep learning and neural networks, um, of deep learning, like neural networks. Um, so 
if you're familiar with machine learning, you know that you need a usually manu manually annotated data set to train the model to be able to recognize relevant patterns. Um, for that, we created a gold standard list with uh, the most, um, the 11 most frequent place names and ethnonyms. Um, this frequency data was based on the uh, English translation of Herodotus histories. And um, we included also the inflected forms of the uh, names because we did not want to rely on uh, lemmatizers. Um, so we then used this gold uh, standard list and extracted all of the sentences that uh, contained a word from this list, a name, a place name, or an ethnonym from this list, and ended up with 1046 sentences uh, as our training data set. Uh, we later noticed that um, our gold standard list was missing uh, dialectal forms and uh, this caused the model to not be able to recognize a lot of the place names and um, yeah and then we added the dialectal spellings to the gold standard list and uh, expanded our data set but I'll get to this point later during the evaluation um, um, part of the presentation. So the next step would be feature engineering. And while machine learning itself is pretty language dependent, feature uh, engineering um, is relies a lot on the type of data, uh, type of language you're working with. So for example, ancient Greek is highly inflectional, which means that word endings bear a lot of meaning. So we use word endings as one of our features. We also use a letter case so we looked at whether um, the word, the target word, is capitalized or not because similar to English, names are also capitalized in ancient Greek. Um, we also use POS tag information from an XML file, I think from um, Prile Tree Bank, and uh, we also use the first letter of the POS tag as one of the features. Um, addition, in addition to these features for the target word itself, we also use these properties of the context words as features. So the tokens preceding and following our target token. Um, exactly. We did not include the word itself, so the whole word, as a feature because we did not want to overfit the model uh, to our data. Um, then step you have to actually work on before uh, the creating the data, uh, the training data set, and before doing everything else is data preparation. Um, and this involves normalization and also a lot of extraction of names and different things from XML files. Um, the normalization step is technically not very complex, but it is very time consuming because a lot of um, characters that look the same to the human eye are actually not the same. So the first step is always Unicode normalization. Not always, but in our case it was Unicode normalization. And then from there you have to just look at your data and find out what uh, is missing and try to remove as much of the irregularities as you can. Um, so in our case, for example, diacritics were a problem. So we had to remove had to remove all of the diacritics um, during the comparison of the strings um, using a library called Greek accentuation. And uh, I also noticed that uh, a lot of times the punctuation 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 marks are different um, in each data source. So we had to re also remove those. And there were in, in a lot of cases too many space characters, for example. So that was one of the problems. Um, at the end, I noticed that there are way too many different irregularities uh, to be able to remove all of them. So for longer sequences, I use fuzzy string matching and it proved to be very helpful and um, really lightened the load of um, work I had to do. Um, I use fuzzy wuzzy, which is a library that uses Levenstein distance to um, compare the strings um, for uh, string similarity. So also with XMLs, there are some problems. Um, apart from the fact that different sources use different citation schemes, uh, there are also uh, structural inconsistencies within one XML file, um, for example, involving embeddings, 
So again, you have to start from the simplest structure and then look at your data and see what is missing and adjust. And this takes a lot of time, even though it's not very complex, it is very time consuming. So after we uh, trained our model, we had to, one second, the presentation is not up updating. Evaluation, exactly. So we wanted to evaluate uh, the predictions and the results we got. We used cross-validation for that. And uh, later, uh, Kiara also manually inspected the predictions to see if there are some recurrent um, patterns um, for the misclassifications and generally how our model is performing. So as you can see, there were uh, a lot of new um, predictions, a lot of the place names were uh, recognized by the model, and we also discovered um, some problems. For example, uh, a lot of the tep toponyms that were um, misqual misclassified were personal names and with similar inflections, and the, the words that were misclassified as ethnonyms were mostly patronomics and adjectival toponyms. Um, for example, Icarian in the string, uh, Icarian in, uh, in the string Icarian C. Um, we also use weight explanation to find out uh, which features are most important for the model and notice that the algorithm assigns the most weight to word endings for positive identification and for negative identification uses context features. For example, um, the, the word ending part again is because of the reflection of ancient Greek and um, the, an, an example for the uh, context features would be the fact that ethnonyms rarely occur at the beginning of sentences because they are always preceded by an article. Um, again, talk, um, coming to the, um, the problem with the dialectal forms, it, this part was very important because Herodotus uh, uses Ionic um, which is his original, um, his native uh, dialect uh, for a lot of the toponyms and a lot of the inflections are very different from Attic, which is the um, standard dialect of Greek, of ancient Greek um, at the time. And um, this is a problem that is um, very important because a lot of the lexicographic sources have Attic as their standard variety and uh, the rest of the dialects as variations. So we had to adjust our gold standard list to be able to recognize all of the toponyms that are also in non-standard um, varieties. <clears throat> so let's get to the results. As you can see, the model performed pretty well, but it could still be improved. Um, I also wanted to include a barcode and also a link to our GitHub repository because we decided to um, put all of the data, all of the algorithm uh, on a public repository in GitHub and uh, you can just take a look at the algorithm, reuse it and maybe also give us some feedback if you like. <laughs> so let's get to our current work. Um, at the time, we are comparing the results, uh, or we already have done that, but we will continue with um, uh, with that uh, to the English translation because we think that we are able to detect some systematic and revealing differences in the translation. Um, for example, we notice, or Kira noticed, because she's the only one who actually um, knows ancient Greek, that uh, sometimes. Um, ethnonyms in Greek are actually translated as toponyms in Greek. For example, the town hall of the Athenians is translated as the town hall of Athens. And also that um, toponyms that are not actually, do, do not exist in the Greek are added in the English translation, uh, in the Greek text. And uh, another thing was that uh, some toponyms in Greek are translated with a synonymous toponym in English. For example, the Attic force is translated as the Athenian force. Um, 
yeah, so we're hoping to be able to just discover some patterns uh, in different sense of translation and uh, we'll continue to work to improve our uh, model. Um, for example, we want to also train the model on a larger data set. Uh, we did not use all of the books uh, of histories in the original, in the first uh, run of the uh, algorithm, and we want to exp exp expand our uh, data set and train the model again and see what happens. Um, so yeah, that is all I have to say. I think um, Kira is gonna talk about some of the limitations uh, of named edge recognition and of our approach next. So thank you a lot for your attention and I'm looking forward to uh, discussing this topic further with you during the Zoom session. Bye. Okay, so I am just very briefly going to talk about the possible limitations of this model and what we in the end understood by applying it. Um, a couple of things that probably some of you have imagined. Uh, this method partly worked with decent accuracy because um, we do have a lot of data about the histories of Herodotus. We had the Hestia project with place names in English, we had a decent amount of part of speech tagging available from other sources, and so on. And in general, we do know the histories of Herodotus fairly well, so we do know what we can expect from a project like this. Um, and this is not the case for the majority of ancient Greek works that deal with um, personal and place names in particular. We do not know a lot uh, about ancient geography, and uh, particularly in literary sources. So what is valid uh, at a decent level of accuracy for Herodotus is not necessarily valid for the majority of ancient Greek works, nevertheless. And current efforts for making this situation better and more generalized are still very slowly growing. Uh, as I mentioned, we do not have available indexes, we have very little annotated corpora in ancient Greek, we still need scholars that could do that in a suitable environment. And finally, for this model in particular, there is a problem of the literary genre, uh, which has been tested in other experiments as well. Um, when using a predictive model that starts from one annotated corpus in one very specific literary genre, nothing tells you that um, the same training data will work as well in another genre. Um, if we use a specific a specific training data set for Herodotus for a historical work. It may work as well for another historical work from the same period, um, like, I don't know, the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides. But it may not, not work as well with something uh, that is completely different, like the Iliad, for example, an epic poetic work. Um, and this is a problem that we will not solve unless we try. Um, so to sum it up, we do have a long way to go and we still have uh, a lot of experiments to do and a lot of models to test. Uh, and I would encourage everybody, every one of you to get your head into the problem and try to see if you can come up with new solutions because there is space. There's a lot of space for innovation in this field. Thank you very much.